Well, hey guys, I hope your week is going well. I'm just finishing the last few dregs of my coffee here this morning before heading out. Just put a little bit of the CeraVe healing ointment on my lips. And right before I head out, I'm probably gonna reapply a little sunscreen. I'm wearing this Ministry of Supply shirt that I got, I think back in the fall. I haven't worn this in a while, but I really like it um, because, um, you know, sometimes it's a little too hot to wear the Coolie Bar long sleeve cardigan. And I can get away with wearing sunscreen on my arms, but I like to have my shoulders protected when I'm going in and out of the car through the parking lot so I like this shirt but anyways enough about that today I wanted to make a video um, because I get a lot of questions about um, our peptide creams copper peptide creams are they legitimate could I make a video talking about those so today I thought I would address peptides in your creams and serums um, is there any role for them there are they helpful beneficial for pores or for anti-aging for quote mature skin um, are they useful ingredients so what is a peptide? A peptide is a chain of amino acids that serves as a precursor for larger proteins in our body that comprise our various tissues and organs, as well as carry out important biological processes like scavenging free radicals, repairing DNA, all of those functions of our day-to-day -day life that we rely on the proteins that our body makes to carry out those functions. We have some preliminary, preliminary laboratory evidence that providing um, cells, peptides, can help to stimulate them to make proteins, okay? We have evidence of that from laboratory studies on cells in a dish. Um, and with regards to your questions about skincare, we have some evidence that putting peptide molecules on fibroblasts, which are the cells in the deeper layer of our skin that make the collagen that, that helps our skin to be firm, plump, um, it makes pores appear smaller just by virtue of filling up the tissue and, and kind of uh, just giving it a supple and, and uh, plump look to the skin. It's, it's very important and it's something that is lost as we age and it, as, it, as it is lost we develop sagging skin, sometimes pores can develop, can become more prominent. So targeting those cells in the deeper layer that make collagen with peptides is an area of interest in stimulating collagen to repair and reverse those visible signs of aging. Now, cosmeceutical companies have <laughs> capitalized on this observation in laboratory studies and bioengineered various peptides that you can find in a wide array of cosmeceutical products, whether they be serums, moisturizers, eye creams, sunscreens, you name it. Um, they will try and tell you that they have the salient peptide that's going to change your life, okay? Um, these bioengineered peptides are, um, are, are modeled after either ones that we ourselves make as humans or plant um, peptides. So for example, it's not uncommon to see um, oat peptides and moisturizers. It's not uncommon to see wheat or rice bran extracts and peptides in moisturizers and serums and things like that. And so bioengineered and natural peptides from plant sources are often included. One uh, synthetic peptide is um, that cosmeceuticals companies frequently put in their products is something called Matrixel or Matrixel. Um, that is the trade name. I think Procter and Gamble owns that, um, which is just a trademarked little peptide that has a um, fatty acid on it. So. It, by putting the little fatty acid on there, in theory, um, it can enhance the penetration of this peptide into the deeper layers of our skin. Um, and theoretically, in doing so, I uh, can get in there and stimulate the fibroblasts to make more collagen. And when they, and when you take that little um, matrixyl peptide and put it on fibroblasts in a dish, it can stimulate them to make to make more collagen. So you know. These companies can show you some, some compelling evidence that it could work. But the idea that it gets into your skin, it just does not seem, just does, does not seem likely. Knowing what, what we know about skin biology and skin as a barrier, namely the epidermis, it just doesn't seem plausible whatsoever. So do peptides have any role in cosmetic skincare products, cosmeceuticals, should you be looking for them, and or why, why if you are, do you see benefit? Many of you say that you see a lot of benefit in using them. Well, here's the thing. 
peptides themselves are molecules that can bind onto water and are excellent humectants, okay? So they are moisturizing. In other words, peptides put on the skin can help hold on to water a little bit better and prevent it from evaporating out of our skin. When skin loses water, such as occurs after, after cleansing, after exfoliating, after washing, if your face is really irritated by doing a lot of peels or retinoids, your skin will lose more water, it will appear drier, it will appear dull, there'll be surface irregularity. Wrinkles will become more prominent just by virtue of volume loss from merely water evaporating out. Pores will become more noticeable. It's really just a space filling phenomenon, however, in that water has, has left the skin. And by using a peptide, um, basically as a humectant, onto the skin, it can kind of help hold onto a little bit of that water as it's escaping and stay on the skin and plump it up a little bit. So for me, I believe that a lot of the benefit that consumers perceive when they use peptide serums is derived from their humectant properties alone. And that's great. There's no harm in using a moisturizer. I advocate using moisturizing ingredients. I advocate using humectants. You all see me using them in my skincare routine, namely the super plumping gel cream that I use. Um, just underneath my moisturizer to kind of combat the damage of washing my face and losing that, that water from the skin after I've just cleansed my skin, okay? And so, I, it's not surprising to me that people see some benefit there, but <laughs> you can achieve that with a simple moisturizer. So, you know, I would encourage you if you're spending a lot of money on peptide serums, I think, uh, you know, we really just don't have the proof that they work um, as far as stimulating our cells and our body to make more collagen. Um, but we, it is likely that they act as moisturizers. So if you're spending a lot of money on them, you might want to consider just trying a plain moisturizer. <laughs> I mean, for me, really what I would need to see to, ha to be convinced at all by using these as far as anti-aging and regenerating and repairing broken down collagen networks and the structural framework of our skin, I would really need to see a long-term you know, blinded study with skin biopsies showing actual restoration of the deeper layer of the skin, actual increased thickness in the dermis, uh, and increased uh, collagen production. I would really need to see that in humans, not just cells on a dish. Um, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I'm not saying it's impossible, it just seems very unlikely. Things getting in the skin, no matter if they have a little fatty acid on them or not, it's, it's just very difficult, you know, it's very difficult to, to ascertain that with any certainty, that that is actually occurring. I could be wrong, but we simply don't have the data yet. The cosmeceutical companies love to take preliminary observations from pilot studies in laboratories and use them as marketing claims. And that is where they come up with things like scientifically proven or <laughs> clinically, no, you know, clinically shown to reverse the signs of aging. So buyer beware, um, we don't have that actual data and people to show that these do anything more than possibly acting as humectants. Now, what about copper peptides? Copper is a trace mineral in our diet that has many roles in the human body as a cofactor for numerous enzymes that play key roles in human biology. Key roles such as repairing collagen, synthesizing collagen, repairing damaged DNA, um, pigment production, uh, reactive oxygen species scavenging. There are many, many enzymes that use copper to work, okay? They can't work in the body without this trace mineral that we largely obtain through our diet, okay? Copper in the diet as a trace mineral helps these enzymes function, allows them to function. Otherwise, they can't work properly. So what about applying copper peptides to the skin? I just mentioned that you know, they are part of our diet as a trace mineral and driving these, these uh, enzymes key to their function. In the early 90s, it was shown that applying copper peptides to wounds um, helped wounds heal faster, okay? Um, not only did it help them heal faster, but it helped them heal with less scarring. Scarring, or a scar, is accumulation of abnormal collagen. And wound healing, and 
and ideal wound healing is a regenerative process, okay? It requires the body to rebuild things. So cosmeceutical companies have extrapolated that into using copper peptides in cosmeceuticals and making the claim that they have regenerative properties for anti-aging. They, they make the claim that copper peptides in cosmeceuticals can help to uh, prevent DNA damage, um, reverse DNA damage, reverse damage in the skin, reverse free radical, um, free radical generation. And free radicals um, are generated through many, many things, one being ultraviolet light exposure in our skin, and long-term free radical generation over time as part of aging of the skin damages the collagen and elastin framework in the deeper layers of our skin, leads to ragging, single, <laughs> leads to wrinkles, sagging, and more prominent pores. But like everything in human physiology and in medicine and science, it's not necessarily the drug, it's the dose, okay? So copper, like I said, is a trace mineral, not a mineral in excess. And too much copper in the diet or, or uh, copper, syndromes of copper overload can actually quite, be quite damaging to the human body. And over, overdoing it, applying copper to the skin, you can imagine it could be as well. Um, we know that too much copper can actually generate free radicals and be very inflammatory and cause, um, you know, pro processes, acceleration of processes that are going to age skin uh, through damage to uh, either DNA or the deeper collagen structure. So for me, you know, copper peptides and peptides in serums and moisturizers, um, I would say as far as just peptides, um, plant-derived peptides and bioengineered uh, mimics of plant peptides, I think are great moisturizing ingredients and great humectants. So I see the utility there, but I would not fall for any claim that they're going to reverse or rebuild your skin. That's simply not likely and has not been demonstrated in any uh, true scientific manner on actual human skin. And then as far as the copper peptides, I really would not waste my time or money with that. Um, the likelihood that they even get into the skin seems, seems nil. And even if they do get into the skin, um, there's really no evidence that they could function there safely. So I would just avoid them. There are some studies trying to get these peptides into human skin using micro needling devices um, or, you know, your derma roller. I have a whole video on micro needling and what it is, what it has been shown to be useful for. And if you'll recall from that video, um, you know, micro needling isn't that that old, right? It hasn't been around that long. And one um, reported um, adverse consequence of microneedling that, that is now being reported is the development of um, foreign body reactions to products that are applied topically to the skin after microneedling. So, you know, the idea of putting a copper serum on after you've had microneedling makes me a little nervous, frankly, and it's something that I wouldn't really condone uh, by virtue of the fact that, like I said in that video, at least with vitamin C serum, we have seen evidence that people can develop uh, foreign body reactions in, and um, you know immune responses to these things that are, that are introduced into the skin, <laughs> okay? Um, so be careful there, you know. Your skin is designed to keep things out for a reason. You should thank it for that. Um, without an intact skin barrier, you know, more bacteria can get into our skin and that can, uh, you know, you can develop bad skin infections. And if things really could get into the deeper layer of the skin where the dermis is and where our structural framework is, that's getting pretty close to our blood vessels. And when things get pretty close to our blood vessels, you really begin to have to question, well then, is this being systemically absorbed and is that safe long term? What, how, what is, you know, if this is getting into the deeper layers of the skin, how how deep is it? <laughs> how deep is your love? You know, you can kind of think of it that way. Like, well, how deep is it going, and is that safe long term? We don't have the answers. So for me, it's something to not uh, get too jazzed about. Maybe a little oat peptide is okay as a as a humectant and a moisturizer. But at the end of the day, the science simply is not there for its uh, for their efficacy or utility. <laughs> yeah, it's like. The cosmetic companies, they love to jump on 
Cosmetic companies love to jump on uh, pilot study observations in, that scientists do, and you know these studies are not bad at all. In fact, they're fantastic, and I really support them. You know, pilot studies. I know a lot of you all are, you know, master's degree students, PhD scientists, um, many people in public health, um, and uh, so you kind of know what I'm talking about. But um, pilot studies are very critical to the way science is done. Um, you know, you have to. You have to generate some what's called preliminary data, some pilot data, um, and publish it in order to build a compelling argument to present to a funding agency to fund your research. And you know the the hardworking scientists in the lab who is striving to make advances in science and medicine um, is kind of is really taken advantage of by these cosmetic companies when they see these results and then you know they can make claim they can make whatever claim they want about about these on their on their products and it simply has not been substantiated in human 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 studies research funding for science has lessened and lessened, gets gets tighter and tighter and tighter every every year it seems. So I, I sympathize with you all out there who who are fighting to get your grants funded. Keep up the hard work. You know, science and medicine relies on that. And I'm sorry when when you know Sephora comes out with a cream that suddenly can can do reverse reverse QPCR on somebody's nose. I mean, really? Like, uh, genome editing? Come on! I mean, you guys out there working in labs who are trying to, you know, who are, are working to get these assays up and running, I mean, you know how, how troubling they are and how difficult they are. The idea that somebody could just slap the reagents on their skin, walk around and be like, hey! But yeah, don't fall for that stuff. You guys are smart and smart consumers. I hope this video was helpful um, in addressing your questions about peptide creams and serums. Um, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.